in looking at this topic and the future that comes, I was reminded of a, a question that was asked by Mahatma Gandhi six decades ago. And the question he asked was, how many planets will it take if India follows the same reckless path of industrialism that Britain has taken, that has already consumed half the world's resources? If we were to transpose the concerns of today, perhaps update that question, China is the great energy consumer and economic engine of Asia. The United States, of course, the economic superpower, even with this week's difficulties. Um, the question might be, how many planets will it take if China industrializes, urbanizes, motorizes on the same pathway that the United States has taken? What if every Chinese jumps into an SUV the way that Americans have historically loved to do in the last decade or two? And is it possible that, in fact, there may be aspects of globalization that might actually help address climate change. Uh, I should say at the outset that I'm an optimist about this problem. I think we will succeed in educating humanity, and I think we have the technology in the pocket already, in the marketplace already, at a heroic scale, that we could scale up to solve this problem, at least over the, the watch of anybody in this room. This is a problem where pessimism on the scientific side is warranted. Uh, environmental scientists are often accused of being alarmist, overly alarmist. And this is one area in which the, the data, as it continues to come in, exceeds the most alarmist of the predictions of the scientific community. You may know, for instance, that the warming, the historical warming of the last two decades is near the upper bound of the range predicted by the IPCC. As we speak today, the Arctic sea ice is about half the size it was about 20 years ago. The Arctic sea ice was about the size of the lower 48 United States 20 years ago. And we have lost an area, all of it east of the Mississippi, plus the states that border on, the western states that border on the Mississippi. That's a large area. About half of it is already gone. The, that in the first seven years of this decade, humanity has um, increased its emissions of greenhouse gases at roughly twice the rate of the previous 30 years. So that now the growth in greenhouse gas emissions exceeds all of the business as usual predictions from the IPCC. Today we're pumping out about 40,000 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in all the greenhouse gases. Every year it's about 40,000 million tons. Most of this is CO2. The U.S. is responsible for 7,000 out of that 40,000 if you add up all our greenhouse gases. But what's not really recognized is that pollution sources are actually a significant part of it. Uh, we emit both black carbon soot through incomplete combustion and carbon monoxide. These gases are not counted as greenhouse gases directly. But they actually make up 10%, probably about four or 5,000 out of the 40,000, is actually created by pollution sources. In some sense, pollution, fixing the pollution problem seems should be a high priority. It could be a quick fix or not. Um, it's driven by what? It's driven disproportionately by the developing world. The developed world puts out most of the CO2. The developing world puts out most of what we think of as pollution, carbon monoxide, NOx, and those species. Uh, just uh, three weeks ago in the Siberia, we discussed in Yurkutsk program for production of butanol. And uh, I just tell, uh, it was a big surprise for me. Uh, a small company today is Pioneer. They already produce butanol and they already drive three uh, small cars uh, on butanol from Siberia to Volga, to Zhigulin. And uh, it looks like butanol is a very good solution for many reasons, economical environment, and very important for Russia, it's not very pleasant to drink it, butanol. <laughs> that today we know that melting of the ice in Iceland affects Bangladesh, and the pollutant, pollution created by China affects Los Angeles or Japan, that we are really looking at this idea of level playing field, that it's everybody's business. And we cannot say that, in fact, we can continue to discuss who caused this, but it is no longer an issue that we can afford to avoid. Public opinion survey after public opinion survey everywhere, including in the developing world, says that people are ready to make changes, but it's the leadership that seems not to be quite as ready as the people themselves. But we might say that 
the fact that both of the presidential candidates this time, at least to some degree, have said that this is in fact a tipping point, this is a crucial issue, is a big change. So we might hope for the fact that in this next administration for the US, we may come to a change that will be different from where we have been. So we may be optimistic in America also. I want to just point out here that while it's very, very true that scientific community, the business community, and the policy world must come together, as you have mentioned, to some extent I feel that it's the policy world, it's a political world rather, that seems to be somewhat slower in picking this up. Climate change is both a manifestation of globalization and, and probably the premier example of how far globalization has, has gone. And it is also the most urgent reason for reforming the systems and the institutions with which we manage global problems. On the other hand, I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for humankind. This, this is a civilizational opportunity, and one of the great opportunities it presents to us is get an economy that is productive, efficient, that creates jobs, that creates wealth, that levels the playing field, reduces disparities, and it is also an opportunity to devise a system of global governance for the 21st century. So every serious analyst now agrees pretty much that there will have to be some kind of carbon pricing mechanism as part of this mix, and many people think that the cap and trade system or some variant of it is the cornerstone of a climate policy. And while there are flaws in any pricing scheme, it seems fairly likely that we're going to get to some kind of carbon trading mechanism on a global basis. The other big dimension which we aren't really talking about is, is energy saving. And I believe strongly that the biggest solution in the immediate future, or the biggest uh, contribution to the solution in the immediate future is the energy saving aspect. And there's very little discussion on that. The NRDC did a study of a number of factories in China. And they found out that by changing the production method somewhat, the level of production and profitability could remain the same but the energy saving would be about 40%. I see the US already as the greatest powerhouse uh, in this area because in the universities and the research department, in many cities and states, in the media and so on, we have a greater combination of strength and forces on this issue than in any other country. It will be a great challenge for the rest of us to then keep up uh, with the leadership that will come from the U.S. And it's not just our company, but it's all immediate. It needs to focus less on the abstract, less on the apocalypse, if you will, and uh, much more about um, a motivating message. And, and not so much about fear, because young people um, uh, get much more um, um, activism from motivational messages than they do negative. Small interventions of bottom-up coupled with a willingness to change at the top is really what we need to get to. I also would say that it's not an either or. I think you need a bottom up and top down. You need policies and you need to get people together and you need to have the bottom up approach as well. But if you don't have the right policies at the top level, no matter how much you do at the grassroots, it's not going to work. So you have to really do both ends and then figure out how to scale it up. We need an international agreement. We need unilateral U.S. action to proceed an international agreement. If you do that, then this will happen. To get to that, you need a massive sort of push of, of awareness building to sort of get over the activation energy to get the first agreement. And then following that, you need a century scale educational commitment to sort of keep the drumbeat going so people understand what this is all about.